Hello and welcome to the NBA Outlet presented by OTGBasketball.com. I'm your host, Nick Faye, and back with me, Corey Waldron. How are we doing, Corey? Good. I feel like I've been on an extended leave and it's only <laughs> been a week. It's, uh, it's strange how fast the NBA world moves. Playoffs are a great time and obviously you don't go on a podcast for three days and a ton happens. Exactly. You know, it's it's crazy. There's a ton to talk about. And today we're going to touch on every series, just kind of like a little recap almost of what we've seen so far, what to expect the rest of the way. But as always, a quick reminder, you can listen to NBA Outlet on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Google Play, Dash Radio. And also make sure you check out OTGBasketball.com for all NBA playoff content. Our guys are putting in a ton of work right now. Check it out. Show some love. But let's get started, Corey. I have some type of random order for the series. Don't ask me how I came up with it, but we're going to sp- start with Spurs and Warriors. Last game we saw, Warriors won 110-97. They lead the series 3-0. What have you seen from this one so far? Well, I'm guessing you did from least exciting to most exciting <laughs> then, right? No, um, no good. the next one you'll, I think you're pretty excited about. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, I mean, this has been what we expected, right? Uh, obviously, terrible news for the Popovich family, Uh Coach Greg Pop lost his wife the other night. Um, extremely sad, obviously, circumstances. So he wasn't with the team for game three. I'm not sure if he's going to be there for game four. He today. will not be there at... for game four either. Okay. So, again, n- no Greg Popovich for the Spurs. Uh, went back to the series, though. I mean, we all predicted this. I predicted the Warriors in five. I believe you predicted the Warriors in four. So this is pretty much right on track with what we predicted. Um the, the the Warriors are too good, right? Even without Curry, they still have Durant. They still have Clay. Um, Draymond offensively hasn't been great, but he does everything else so well. And uh, LaMarcus Aldridge, besides game one, has been solid, but he's just not enough. I mean, the Spurs are too thin. They don't have enough explosive offensive scores to keep up with the Warriors' offense. And uh, it looks like this series will probably be wrapped up today. Yeah, it looks like a sweep. And the Warriors, like you said, without Steph, they're still playing great. People forgot they were just sleeping on them, you know, saying like, oh, I think the Spurs might give them trouble. No, that's not going to happen. Uh, number one in net rating. They have uh, four guys, the top four guys in net rating in terms of players. And then number six is also a Warrior, and that's JaVale McGee. You know, these guys have just been killing it. Kevin Durant has been a monster. You know, they really don't have an answer for him. Clay Thompson's been having some hot games. Draymond, like you said, has been solid. Andre Iguodala in that point guard role has been great. Some of the bench dudes have stepped up. Quinn Cook, you know, David West has had some solid minutes here and there. Also, Sean Livingston, I think, had a big game three. I mean, the only concern, I think, for the Warriors is uh, KD and Livingston both sprained their ankle in game three. So going for game four, you know, hopefully they're healthy. But as long as they wrap it up, they'll have a nice break to the next round. Yeah, I, I, almost everything you just said was spot on. Um, the... The Warriors' only concern, I think, for out, throughout the entire playoffs, is going to be health. Obviously, yeah. they had a couple small injuries. Steph is coming back, but I think he's now doing um, contact, or he's doing he's doing more extensive drills. So it looks like he's going to be good to go for the next round. Obviously, a series we'll talk on later uh, went a little bit faster. I think the Warriors expect it to go and probably hope for it to go. Uh, but the Warriors are in fine shape, and I think, like you said, um, everybody wanted there to be some sort of kink in the armor to say they wanted the Warriors to be hobbled. Everyone wanted to think the Spurs could make this a series and that's just not the case. There's no reason to doubt the Warriors. There's really no reason to doubt the Rockets either. We'll talk about more. Uh, these are the two best teams in the West and until proven otherwise, no one should be sleeping on them. Yeah. I mean, in, in the no offense to the Spurs, they were probably one of the worst playoff teams in the West. You know, they're just missing their best player. Uh, three-point shooting-wise, they're not very good. It's just like they don't have a ton of weapons on that team to beat many of these Western Conference playoff teams. So we, we expect this one to be wrapped up today. Yeah, it's, it's going to be another – it's funny because like going into the playoffs, I projected no sweeps, and we're looking at the second one happening today. Yeah, the other one was a super big surprise, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But a series that I know you're very interested in, and that's the Pacers and the Cavs. Pacers pulled off game three, 92-90, lead the series 2-1. Give me your thoughts on this. You know, um, as as Stan Van Gundy said during the game one, he goes, this is the first Pacers game I've seen all season. Uh, majority of the people have not watched any Pacers all season. Uh, Matt Moore had a tweet yesterday, which I truly felt on a personal level, where he said, if you haven't watched the Pacers all year, you're thinking, how the, how the hell is Bojan Bogdanovic, you know, scoring this many points and destroying the Cavs? This shouldn't happen. And he goes, but if you're a Pacers fan, 
you know how good Bojan Bogdanovic has been for the Pacers, and he's been crucial. In games where Bojan Bogdanovic has scored 25 points or more this year, the Pacers were 7-2. and two. Uh, Game 3 was the second time this season the Pacers came back from down 15 against the Cleveland Cavaliers, both pre-trade deadline trades and then post-trade deadline trades. So the Pacers have done this to both Cavs teams. Uh, this was the tenth time this season the Pacers came back from trailing by fifteen or more. Um, the the team just plays hard. They they come out of the gate slow at times, and I think what Game Three really showed too. Uh, obviously, the the basketball community, NBA Twitter, and the the world in general for the NBA, they know Victor Oladipo is most likely most improved player. They know he's been great, but on a night where he was four of eighteen from the field and he was truly struggling, or five of fifteen, where he was truly struggling, um, the Pacers still won. And that's something that you don't see often in the playoffs when your star player struggles. You generally don't play well. We saw that in Portland. Um, we've seen that with the Cavs when LeBron has not been at his absolute best. Um, and the Pacers won because of Bogdan Bogdanovich, who had 30 to LeBron's 28. He's held LeBron on defense. He's caused LeBron more problems on defense than any other Pacers defender, which is something that I would never think I'd say. Well, I'll say this about the defense, though. Like, I I respect Boyan. He's definitely putting a lot of effort and energy. But I will say the Pacers' overall defensive scheme against LeBron has helped dramatically because if you watch them D up on LeBron, it's all five guys are locked in, especially with the way the Cavs are playing. Like, there's – they have a – Nate McMillan has done a great job making LeBron's life difficult. You know, he's understood what's going on. And the supporting cast on Cleveland has not made the Pacers pay at all. They've been so bad. Jordan Clarkson – He's bad back-to-back two-point games. Game three, Kyle Korver, zero points. If I'm the Pacers, like you mentioned, Corey, Victor Oladipo didn't have a great game, and they still won. And the Pacers didn't even play a great four quarters. Like you mentioned, they've come back a lot this season. But in the playoffs against the LeBron team, usually you need to put together four good quarters to win the game. And I think that's the biggest worry about the Cavs. It's like, no, this team really isn't that good. Well, and I, I think the issue for the Cavs, too, is, you know, we knew all year their defense wasn't good, but their offense has been more of an issue in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, they, they haven't been – what they, they've only touched 100 one game, right? They, game yep. two was the only game they touched 100. You know, that's – we saw this Cavs team uh, all year scoring, you know, 110, 115 and giving up, you know, 110, 115. They just didn't play any defense. And now, obviously, in the playoffs, the tempo slows down and the game changes – but the Pacers have the Cavs playing their speed and their type of play. The Cavs aren't playing Cavaliers basketball. I mean, obviously, like you mentioned, Jordan Clarkson has two points. Uh, George Hill had a good start to game three, but then he had back spasms in the second half, so his game really fell off. Uh, Kevin Love was steady, but, you know, Kevin Love has not been a real force this series for most of it. He's got the I, poor Thaddeus Young has been a reason stuff. why, too. Yeah, Thaddeus, um, Thaddeus Young, obviously, uh, I know you know him from the Nets days. He just plays I know a lot of so your team energy. from the next days. <laughs> yeah, Booker, yeah, true, Boyan, you know. Dad Young. <laughs> just shows that the Nets have uh, the right pieces, right? The Nets do get winning pieces. Um, but he's been steady. Thaddeus Young, is, is he's the energy guy. He's kind of the glue guy, if you will. He does, you know, the extra plays, the hustle. Um, he had a couple of huge blocks in game three, a couple of timely rebounds. He just does the little things. And you need guys like that who they're not a vocal point necessarily offensively, but they do all the little things that you need that don't show up on the staff sheet, which is what Thad does. Um, and like you mentioned, he's he's been the physical body on LeBron at times. He's giving Kevin Love a tough time. Uh, they, they're just playing team basketball. It, it's really fun to watch. Yeah, Thad's a perfect complimentary player for a starting lineup that already has some scores. Like you said, he doesn't need the ball. He'll get you a few offensive rebounds, a few putbacks, play some good defense. He'll dive on the ball for some, lo- uh, for some loose balls and stuff like that. So... You got to give him props. And Boyan, he's a guy, obviously, I know pretty well. And he has the potential to be very good in terms of offensive scoring. And then he has the potential to be very bad. He's just such a hot and cold confidence type of guy. But if I'm the Pacers and he put up a game like this, I'm very happy because I have a good feeling it'll probably carry on the rest of the series. Yeah. Um, I just want to also say a, a sound bite from yesterday. Uh, during practice, Lance Stevenson told reporters that the Pacers are in full control right now. And that uh, if they were to go into a three-one lead, that the pay- that the Cavs would panic. Um, um, so I think Lance should do a little research. Yeah. So yeah, right. They've already beat the three-one. Although they did have a Kyrie Irving, but um, yeah. So 
And that's also the kind of stuff where if LeBron hears, uh, as I mentioned to you, I think, in the Twitter DMs the other day, uh, I think LeBron's going to drop 50 tonight. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see an all-time great performance because that's the only way the Cavs can beat the Pacers. The Pacers yeah. are the better team in this series, but the Cavs have the best player. And that's what it's going to come down to. Is LeBron great enough to overcome a better team? Or can the Pacers have a collective unit to stop, you know, Andre the Giant? Yeah, honestly, you know, LeBron put up a ridiculous game in game two, a historical game in terms of efficiency in the playoffs scoring wise. He's going to have to do that. And his teammates are going to have to step up if they're going to win the series. You know, LeBron, even in the fact is if he puts up like, you know, four more, uh, three more 40 point games, there's not a guarantee he's going to win all those games. You know, Kevin Love has to play bigger. One of these bench guys has to like step up. You know, Roddy Hood, Jordan Clarkson, J.R. Smith, one of these role players, somebody has to score some points consistently to help LeBron out. He can't do it all on his own. No, I 100% agree. And um, I know you can say it's about almost every game in the playoffs. Uh, game four is is the series to me tonight. Uh, at 830, if the Cavaliers win this game, I still have the Cavs in seven if they win this. But the Cavs have to win tonight. They have to keep trading. You know, they say the playoffs don't start till you win on the road. If the Cavs don't win tonight, I do think the Pacers will win this series in six. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll give them a lot of confidence, and then they'll have, you know, a couple shots to take the Cavs out. So, I mean, I it's tough for me to, like, really clamp on the, you know, who wins tonight just because we've seen LeBron do it in the past. But if I was a Pacers fan, I'd feel pretty confident, especially if the supporting cast doesn't show up once again. And, hey, well, uh, the Cavs are making adjustments. Tristan Thompson will be in the rotation tonight. And he plans on uh, – Tyron Lue actually plans on playing him a decent amount of minutes. And George Hill remains questionable tonight with uh, back spasms. So we don't know if Tristan Thompson is going to help the Pacers or help the Cavs at this point. But <laughs> Right. We know that it'll be a, he'll probably get booed, though, no matter what. Yeah, well, which is well-deserved because obviously yes. he's been – Yeah, doing a ton of uh, all types of nonsense. But whatever, that's for another day. Next series – Wizards and Raptors. This series got a little bit of life in Game 3. We saw a couple skirmishes. Now Raptors leave 2-1, and there's a little bit more hope that the Wizards can compete in this series after finally showing up for a game. Well, they showed up in Game 1, Nick. You know That, that game was back and forth until the, the fourth quarter. Well, I mean, I'm pretty sure they, they like made a run in the fourth quarter to get it tighter, but I felt like the Raptors were pretty much in control in Game 1. They, like, they weren't playing their best basketball. Right, okay. That's fair. Yeah, um, I mean, we saw – what Game 3 proved is how good the Wizards are when their best two players are playing, right? You know, Wall and Beal had 28 apiece, um, and the Wall was efficient too. That That's – I mean, that's more or less the bigger issue. If Wall is scoring and being efficient, you know, the playmaking is going to be there and the, the, the blocks and the few steals, that's all going to be there. It's whether or not he's efficient. Um, in Game 1, he struggled making layups, which is something you don't see a lot from John Wall. And then game three, we just saw him hitting shots. And we saw Bradley Beal, who was kind of like a, um, in the background the first two games, came to life in the third. Obviously, being at home and in Washington, it gives you a different sort of energy playing in front of your home crowd. And Beal, I think, really fed off that. Scott Brooks but, also yeah. had a meeting with John Wall and Bradley Beal prior to the game, trying to get Beal more involved. And I think there's also talk about going to Porter, Otto Porter more involved, too, but that didn't happen. Well, there you go. I didn't even know that. So, yeah, um, Scott Brooks gets a lot of heat, too, for not being a, a very good coach. People like to say he's not a good coach, but, you know, that uh, little pep talk obviously had some kind of uh, positive effect on the Wizards. But um, I, I still think this is the Raptors in six. All this did to me, the game three win was assured that this can probably go six still. I think the Raptors are still the better team. Um, the only issue I really have is, uh, you know, I I think – I, I, I just want more from Kyle Lowry, I think. I, I, I know he played decent in game three, but the the playoff Kyle Lowry to me is still too prominent in my mind. Yeah, he needs a splash performance to kind of wipe that away. I think Ibaka had a rough game, only three points, and um, two of those points came on a transition dunk. And then also looking at it, you know, the Raptors had 18 turnovers. They just didn't take care of the ball. The, they didn't play their best game of the series. And like you said, the Wizards stepped up at home. Also, like the little skirmishes in that game, you know, OG and uh, Markeith Morris and then John Wall and Ibaka, Bradley Beal and uh, JV. Like there was just a, a little bit of more action. And like I mentioned on Players Watch, I feel like anytime there's more action, the home team or a team that doesn't necessarily step up all the time, like the Wizards or like an OKC team, when you kind of piss them off, you're more likely to get the best out of them. So you got to be careful with that. 
And that, also, I, I, I have to say this because we, we've given him a lot of crap on this podcast. Uh, Gortat had his best game of the series by he cut far. his hair. Yeah, yeah, right. He, he changed up his appearance. Now it's a new man. Um, he had 16 points, five rebounds, was eight for 10 from the field. It was a plus 12. And, you know, that's been huge because Gortat has been, uh, for lack of a better word, trash in games one and two. He had zero points in game two. He had 12 and six in game one. Um, so we, we really saw the best version of Gortat. And obviously Wall got him involved in a lot of pick and rolls and some games, some easy looks. But, uh, you know, he had a huge game three. And shout out to Mike Scott, who's been cooking this series, shooting over 70% from the field. Uh, yeah, 70% from the field and 80% from three. I had to make sure I was reading that correctly. Yeah, he's he's been steady all year. I'm, I'm, honestly, he's he's been just about instant offense all season. Uh, he never scores, you know, a ton of points, but it seems like every jump shot I see him take, it's crisp and it's nothing but net. Yeah, 17 points per game in this series. So pretty impressive stuff from him. And overall, plus 33 in the playoffs in terms of uh, plus minus. Yeah, see, the, the role players are going to be key for Washington, especially when they're going against, um, what, what's the Raptors call their bench, the bench mob? Like every other good bench in the history of the NBA, they call themselves the bench mob. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, yes, the, the 2018 bench mob of the Toronto Raptors, which is the best in the league, you know, you're definitely going to need a bench that uh, somewhat matches up against them. And Oubre stepped up, too, and that's a guy I felt like who needs to step up in the series. And like you said, with the Raptors having so much talent on their bench, you need to match that a little bit. But moving on to another series that saw a little bit more life in Game 3, and that's Milwaukee and Boston. The Bucks picked up the win, 116-92. Boston still leaves the series 2-1. But I think this kind of opened up the series a little bit more, where people were kind of getting worried about uh, Milwaukee in the sense that it might be a four- or five-game series. Now I think they're back open-minded to something a little bit longer. I still, uh, I'm still rolling with Celtics in seven. I, I think the Celtics played with a lot of home energy the first two games. Obviously, Terry Rozier had some huge games. Jalen Brown had a huge 30-point game, too. And, um, you know, uh, I hate that the Bucks won to a degree because I, I, I wanted Eric Bledsoe to have to eat his words of the – And he came to play. Know, he did come to play. He, he stepped up and – I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Anto Kumpo and Middleton have been studs through all three games. Um, both guys are playing at a really high level right now. Uh, Anto Kumpo is, you know, um, he didn't have the point total, but he was still so efficient in game three. And that that's to me is what's scary uh, for the Celtics, at least, is, you know, Anto Kumpo was in foul trouble for game three. He played just 27 minutes, had just 19 points. Um, and, you know, the Bucks still won in – you know, in for sure fashion, you know, 116 to 92 when your best players in foul trouble and only plays 27 minutes. You know, that's not a good look for the Celtics. Yeah, they're, I mean, the Bucks are pretty much in control from the first quarter. 27 12. Uh, Boston had nine turnovers, only made two field goals. And you mentioned Giannis is averaging 28 9 and 7 in the series. Middleton's averaging 26 6 and 4 in the series. So both these guys have stepped up shooting good numbers. What we saw in game three was a lot of the role guys and supporting cast stepped up. You mentioned Bledsoe. Thon Maker had a big uh, big game in terms of blocks. Hit a Huge few threes. Huge block on Jason Tatum. Yeah. He was blocking everybody. Like, he actually had a really big impact defensively. And it'll be intriguing to see what he does the rest of the series. For sure. Uh, he had four blocks in that first quarter. And also, that was a big reason why um, I, was, I was stunned when I saw, you know, the Celtics didn't have a field goal for nine minutes and 11 seconds uh, in that first quarter which is, you know, you don't see that in the playoffs often. That's not but, even know, in basketball games. <laughs> no, but that, but I think, you know, to the Celtics' defense, you know, there's, there's a lot of young guys in that team still. You're going into your first, you know, road game, or not first road game, but you're going into a road game atmosphere. You know, you don't have a star player, and some of those guys like, you know, Jalen Brown and Terry Rozier, you know, you have to be huge even on the road. And I think when you get punched in the mouth to start a game, it, it kind of just left them uneasy for the rest of the game. Yeah, definitely. And the defense was stepped up by Milwaukee. And obviously, you know, the crowd was hyped because Aaron Rodgers is now a part owner of the Bucks, So a little extra juice there. I didn't. When did that happen? That happened on uh, Friday night. They announced it. I'm sure it was in the works for a while, but now he's part owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. I think uh, maybe the one of the first athletes to, you know, play in professional sports and own part of another professional sports team. Wow. There we go. Cheese head. My boy. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I expect Steph to probably be one of the next guys to do it. There's been a lot of talk about him buying into the Carolina Panthers. I wouldn't be surprised. 
Yeah. But hey, back LeBron. To this... Le- LeBron could be lurking for something. Yeah, LeBron will be lurking. It's like, does he really want to buy into the Browns, though? <laughs> nah, maybe the <laughs> but... Indians. Cleveland Indians. Yeah, maybe the Indians. Solid. Um, but back to the series, I mean, in the defense stepped up, the supporting cast stepped up, and, uh, like, just the length they had, it was more apparent in this series, and they were just playing with a lot more energy. And uh, recovery-wise, defensively, when they play with energy, they're so long, they can make up for mistakes just with that athleticism and length. Yeah, I, I mean, we've mentioned this, I think, numerous times this year because of how tall they are. You know, you, get, you have a lineup with Bledsoe, Brogdon, uh, Middleton, Kumpo, and let's say Thon, if he plays like he did last night. You know, that's a really tall lineup with a bunch of really good defenders. Um, Just between I, Giannis, I, Thon, and uh, Middleton, that's like probably almost like 21 to 24 like feet of like wingspan. Exactly, yeah, uh, ridiculous. And then, you know... Uh, I, I think when when those guys are on the start, let's say you know those guys are starting. When those guys have a really positive impact, I think Game Three was a perfect example of of what what happens when the Bucks starters play well. It opens up the court, I think, for a guy like Jabari because Jabari had his best game of the series as well. He stepped the up third. defensively too. He put in more effort. He just played like a baller instead of just like I don't know what he was doing in Game One and Game Two. Yeah, he had a couple blocks and a steal, and you know, off the bench. You know, Parker could be a game changer for this Bucks team. If he comes off the bench and he gives them, you know, offensive pop and not great defense, but just the kind of, you know, defensive uh, tenacity that he gave in game three. Yeah, it would be big. I mean, Jabari's a guy we know is very talented. It's been a weird season. Obviously, coming back from injury always makes it tough. And his role not being really, you know, sure of what it is, it kind of hurts him too. What do you think in Game Four? What do you think of this series? I mean, I still like the Celtics probably to win it in seven as well. But you think you know Bucks pull off Game Four? Yeah, I, I think I think it's going to be a battle of home court. Uh, I don't think any team in this series is going to win on the road. I think the Bucks are going to win Game Four. Celtics will win Game Five, and we'll be back um, in Milwaukee for a Game Six, where Giannis will probably drop a triple double with forty, you know, ten and ten, and we'll be back for a Game Seven in Boston. Yeah, uh, I, I don't, I just these teams. To me, it's the the inexperienced Bucks versus the well coached but you know hobbled Celtics, and I, I think I think the the game today will be a lot closer. But I, I just don't have a ton of faith in the, the the Celtics offense to be as consistent and you know d- not what's the word I'm looking for um, explosive as it was in games one and two. Yeah, and I think turnover wise is probably the biggest issue for the Celtics. When they let the Bucks get out and run, build up that confidence, get the energy going, it really helps them. So take care of the ball. And obviously that's hard, like you mentioned, playing a lot of younger guys, some inexperienced guys that don't really aren't used to this playoff I, I environment. Mention this, I want to mention this too, because I, I saw this, you know, the Celtics had sixteen turnovers in game three. Well, the sixteen turnovers came from four players only. Oof. Horf- Horford had two, Rozier had five. Marcus Morris had four, and Greg Monroe had five. Those are the only turnovers the Celtics had all game were from those four guys. Um, obviously, Terry Rozier as a point guard needs to be a lot better at protecting the basketball. He can't be that careless. Greg Monroe can't have five. <laughs> yeah, and Marcus Morris shouldn't have four. You know, your bench players can't come in and give the ball up that nine times. That's just not winning basketball. But um, I'm sure Brad Stevens will obviously push that on those guys to be more careful and to take care of the basketball. Yeah. Moving on to the next series, Rockets and T-Wolves. Another Game 3 win for a team that had no wins in the series, and the Wolves picked it up. Pretty pretty nice win for the, the T-Wolves here. I mean, I honestly didn't expect it. I'm also really surprised the Rockets' offense hasn't been that great. They're ninth in terms of the postseason offensive rating at 106. They were number two in the NBA this season. So that offense just hasn't exploded yet. Yeah, uh, the, the, Rap- the Raptors. The Rockets' offense definitely hasn't been – as prolific as we've seen. Um, the only bright spot for them is, you know, Harden and Chris, I mean, especially Chris Paul. Chris Paul has been uh, really good for the most part. James Harden is struggling with his shot a little bit between game two. And uh, even last night he had 29 points, but he was nine for 21 from the field. Uh, for me, I think the, the, the Rockets will be okay. I still have Rockets in five. Um, I knew the Timberwolves would, would, would win at least one game. When you have Jimmy Butler, Carl Anthony Towns, and Andrew Wiggins, and Jeff Teague, you have to win one game. You know, if that team got swept, there are bigger issues than them playing against the great Rockets. Uh, and obviously, I know there's the Derrick Rose stains out there who are having a field day because Derrick Rose had a huge game in 21 minutes last night. Um, eight for 16 from the field, 17 points. 
he was instant offense in the second quarter where he had 10 points. Um, and, uh, you know, that's been, that's been huge too for the Wolves is if their bench unit can give them some pop because the Rockets bench, it hasn't been that great through the last couple of games. You mentioned Jimmy Butler. He's a guy that stepped up. He looked a lot healthier yesterday too. And, uh, Jeff Teague, he had a nice game. He was blown by everybody on Houston. A lot of from him. Yeah, defensively, Houston looked like trash yesterday. They didn't do a great job protecting the rim. Carl Anthony Towns finally decided to join the playoffs. He showed a lot more tenacity yesterday and energy and understood that, you know, it's not going to be the regular season. I actually have to fight for positioning a little bit more. So that's, you know, a positive from the Wolves. But if I'm the Rockets, I'm probably not that upset because, like I mentioned, the offense hasn't popped yet. And, like, you know that it eventually they're going to hit their threes and they're going to start making shots. Some of that has to come with energy, but I still feel pretty confident about them. But also on the other end of the spectrum, if I'm the Rockets, I'm like, yo, we need to get our group going because this isn't going to cut it going to the next round. There were several times um, – I, I should have kept track of how many times I saw it, but I know I saw P.J. Tucker miss at least two wide-open threes. Eric Gordon missed at least, you know, two or three wide open threes. Uh, Trevor Ariza hit a couple, but I saw him miss at least one or two wide open threes. The issue with the Rockets is, that, like you said, their offense just isn't hitting shots that we saw them make all year. You know, yeah, they're getting the looks. They're still getting the wide open looks from three. You know, the offense is still working. The shots just aren't falling. Exactly. So we'll see what happens with that, but I'm not super concerned. I think the most concerning thing would probably be like Jimmy Butler's house for the T-Wolves. If he can stay healthy, it gives him a lot better chance, but I'm still groaning with the Rockets. And this was also one game, um, too, that they, they didn't really use a lot of Clint Capella. Yeah. Um, it, you know, we saw in game one and two, they used him in the pick and roll. They did uh, a good job adjusting Timberwolves. They did a good job preventing yeah, him they, a little they, bit from they getting did take him out of the a nice. They, they took him out of the, the high pick and rolls. They, they did a great job with, with putting a lot of pressure up on um, whoever the ball handler was and taking Clint Capella kind of out of the game. But um, I, I don't expect that to happen again. Uh, you know, Clint Capella has been huge for them, and I think um, we'll see more of that pick-and-roll action in game four. Eric Gordon's a guy that needs to step up. Five of 16, three and nine from three. He just doesn't seem to be in the groove right now, and they need him in the postseason to be that dominant bench scorer if they really want to make one of these deep runs. Yeah, he missed a ton of shots. You know, he's like I said, he's one of the guys who I saw at least miss, you know, two or three wide open threes, um, yeah. which you just don't normally see. You know, we know him as one of the best three point shooters in the game, a six man of the year, a ca- winner and candidate. But um, yeah, he's definitely got to be better. Yeah, and Chris Paul with foul trouble definitely hurt too. But we'll see what happens in the next game of the series, which will be huge because I think if you know the T Wolves do win Game Four, it puts a lot more pressure on Houston that they might not have anticipated, and a lot of us didn't anticipate, obviously going to this series with the defense that Timberwolves play. Well, I think one thing to mention too, aside from the defense, is the fact that this will you know they had thirteen made threes between Game One and Two, and they had fifteen last night. You know, Andrew Wiggins was four for six. Andrew Williams is not, you know, a four for six three point shooter. Um, he's rather inconsistent at times. But you know, when him, Teague, and Butler combined for uh, eleven threes, that that's a winning formula right there. Yeah, the Timberwolves three point shooting has been super inconsistent all year. Like where I think I've seen them have games where they've made under five threes in a game. So we'll see what happens in this three point shooting in the rest of the series. But OKC versus Jazz, I know this is a lot of people's favorite series. The Jazz pulled off the W last night, 115-102. They lead the series 2-1. What are your thoughts on this one? Well, uh, corner Russell Westbrook, he's going to shut that shit off next game for Ricky Rubio. Uh, oh, well, um, he should yeah. have last game, huh? <laughs> right, right. If he has such a switch, why'd you have to wait a game? Um, man, that uh, that run – that the Jazz had where they went on a 25-6 to six run. Rubio had 13 points on that run, a couple threes. You know, he was two for nine for three, but he had both of his threes on that run. Um, Donovan Mitchell with 22 points, uh, Rudy Gobert with 18 and 12. Um, it, you know, the the starters for the Jazz were were everything last night. Their bench unit only had 15 points. Oh, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, 17 points. Uh, of their 115. Um, it was starter heavy. The The Thunder continued to be a disappointment to me. Um, you know, Carl, Carl, Carmelo Anthony with a nice minus 20. Corey Brewer with a mi- nice minus 20. Westbrook minus 25. 
Uh, the Thunder just from game to game looks so different to me. It's it's very frustrating. They might that may be the most frustrating team in the postseason. Like there's just so many issues: bad shot selection, isolations, you know, lack of sets, not even calling pick and roll sometimes, just lazy turnovers, transition D's questionable at times, closing out on three point shooters. They just do so many of like the small things wrong. And they can get away with a lot of time during the regular season because of their talent. But in the playoffs, it really comes back to bite them, especially against a more disciplined team like Utah. 100%. You know, and, um, you know, Westbrook, I love Russell Westbrook. I, I am a he huge fan of up. Westbrook. He does need to step up. And it's and to me, it's not even that he needs to step up. He just needs to be smarter. Um, some of the passes he made, the carelessness with the basketball with eight turnovers, the – the continuation of taking contested threes when you're shooting under 30% for the year. Like, that's not your shot, man. I I know you've hit a ton of clutch threes in your career. You know, they aren't falling this year for whatever reason. Uh, adjust your game to how you're playing this year. He has not had a good jump shot all year, but he, he continues to want to shoot the jump shot. Um, and then, you know, Paul George, you know, I don't know how you go from dropping 39 in game one and then to becoming, you know, just, again, like kind of falling out of the offense. You Shots like has been playoff... pretty bad for him, too. Yeah, and where's, where's playoff P? You know, he gave all this talk about playoff P, and I've seen playoff P. This is not playoff P. Um, and and then, of course, Stephen Adams uh, being in foul trouble kind of hurt. That, like, the... really kills them. Like, when Adams is in foul trouble, it really hurts the team. And especially when they have Gobert on the floor and rebounding wise, like Patrick Patterson put in some decent minutes in some parts of the game, but Adam's size against Gobert really gives him a nice boost. Yeah. And I mean, they had a lineup on the floor last night where it was Westbrook, Jeremy Grant, Paul George, Corey Brewer, and Carmelo Anthony. And, you know, talk about small ball. Uh, that lineup was the lineup on the floor when the Jazz went on the 25 to 6 run. And it's because Adams was in foul trouble. Um, and if you're the Jazz, you know, get Adams in foul trouble. That, that's got to be the, you know, attack Adams, get him in foul trouble. Because if that's a lineup that Billy Donovan thinks is going to be a successful lineup, then, my Lord, there was no defense on that run by the Jazz. Um, there was no rebounding. Jeremy Grant was playing center. I mean, it's just, it's a mess, uh, especially when Adams goes down like that. And it's just like if the other guys aren't stepping up, like you can get away with small ball in certain situations, but all five guys have to play as a unit and play well defensively. Uh, we just need guys to step up, you know, in terms of OKC. Like Westbrook needs to play better. Paul George needs to play better. Melo needs to play better. He needs to just put in more effort in general. We're, like, we're doomed on the Melo front. We're doomed. There's there's uh, no point in hoping for a Melo to have a good impact, I feel like. I, like I, I keep hoping. I think we just need to let that die. I might you like if I'm uh, Donovan, I might consider cutting his minutes down a little bit, maybe playing Patterson or Grant a little bit more just because of the energy and effort. You know, especially with yeah. Derek Peterson have a big game three, but game two he was huge. So something to keep an eye on. This series has to feel a seven though, still. It just feels like OKC is going to like go down, then come back, win a game, play like shit, and then come back, win a game, and then game seven, we'll see what happens. I, I think that's just like the star power, right? Because. What are the odds that Westbrook, you know, has another terrible game in a row or Paul George struggles? I think it's one of those series, like you mentioned, where um, the stars for OKC may have a game like they did in game three, but then likely in game four they'll have a game one performance where, like, you know, they're Westbrook playing – Westbrook almost had a quadruple-double with turnovers. Yeah. Um, his specialty at times, right? Yeah, uh, like it's it's rough. And, you and know, the – Give the, the Jazz credit, though, their defense has been nice. And no, of course. The, the Jazz defense, I think, goes without saying. You know, the consistency, um, it all stems from Rudy Gobert being the protector of the paint. Um, and then it goes down to, you know, Joe Inglis is fantastic. He does so many little things that go unnoticed, I feel like. Um, Jay Crowder, who isn't shooting well this series, has still been a somewhat decent defender for them. Uh, Ricky Rubio uh, has surprised me with how well he actually plays on both ends of the floor. Um, they're just a complete team. Quinn Snyder has done a tremendous job in Utah. And last night in general, the first off, the uniforms, I love those uniforms, the orange ones, the heat or whatever they are. Those are fantastic. The court looked dope. And that arena last night was rocking. I mean, from the, from the minute that ball tipped off, that entire 
stadium arena was just rocking. That team, that crowd was energized. Yeah, a lot of people put them in the top five in terms of crowds. And this is such a strange game looking at the stats of it. You know, OKC shot 50% from the field. They won the turnover battle by two. And they lost, and they still lost by 13. But that's because they got destroyed on the boards, 56 to 37. Yeah. Uh, and the offensive rebound, they lost 13 to 6. Yeah, and a lot so, of that obviously is Adams not playing, and that's you know the foul trouble, and that becomes like some of it is Adams fouling, but also it's the perimeter defenders not helping him out and defending their man and kind of forcing them all to him. Yeah, and I completely agree, and I think it's just because I mean if you look at it realistically, uh, the Jazz are a lot faster, I think, than than the Thunder, and in, in terms of you know Carl Carl Car Car what was I trying to say Carmelo Anthony. Um, you know, obviously isn't the quickest of, of feet. Uh, Corey Brewer is a tenacious defender, but he, again, is not as quick of feet on defense as he used to be. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just think the Jazz are a little bit – they have more pop in their step, especially from game three at least. Yeah, someone needs to wake OKC up. We'll see what happens with that series. Moving on to game fours. Sixers and Heat, this has been a great series, a ton of fun. 106-102, Philly pulled off the win. Now they have, excuse me, a 3-1 lead in this series. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I was definitely impressed. I thought Miami would tie it up yesterday. Uh, I think for me what's surprising is the fact that Miami has had a lead, I believe, at halftime in three of the four games, and they have just one win to show for it. Um, they they had a, a solid third quarter, and then they fell apart in the fourth quarter. Um, and it was a game where Joel Embiid wasn't uh, offensively he having was a huge impact. You know, he, yeah, he had just 14 points, 2 of 11 shooting. But um, on defense, he was fantastic. Uh, five blocks, you know, he had 12 rebounds. Uh, ben Simmons, the triple-double, first since Magic Johnson, I believe, in 1980 as a rookie. Um, J.J. Redick, my X-Factor, another 24-point outing. The, the Sixers, who I said needed to prove they could close games out to beat the – a team that couldn't close games out in the regular season that I needed to see them close games out in the playoffs – they're closing out games. You know, they're, they've been trailing at halftime, and they're coming back on a more experienced, uh, I, I b at least believed, a better coach team in the Miami Heat now, you know, three games. And uh, this series could be over in five. Fourth quarters have been huge. I think they destroyed them in game three in the fourth quarter, and then game four, another 10-point lead in the fourth quarter. So they stepped up, like you said, and it's like, you know, one day it's going to be J.J. Redick. One day it's going to be Bellinelli. They have these shooters. They have these role guys that can step up. And like you said, even the days that Embiid isn't very good, he had a ton of turnovers, didn't shoot well. He stepped up in the, four, in the fourth, had an impact in the paint. And Ben Simmons, same thing. Not necessarily a great game turnover-wise, had a turnover issue. But then in the fourth quarter, they stepped up. It's like this team really understands what they need to do in the postseason to win games. And one thing about this series I think that's hurt Miami is this has been the highest pace in terms of all the series. You know, both these teams are playing at 103 per 100 uh, possessions. And Miami, I think, would benefit from slowing the game down a little bit because they just don't have the same offensive firepower. But they're probably looking at the other end of the spectrum, too. It's like, you know, Philly plays great defense. How are we going to score on them? It's a really tough series for them, and I just don't think they have the pieces to match up with Philly. Yeah, I mean, although Whiteside had his best game of the series in game four with 13-13, um, you know, he, he looked really tired at a lot of points of the the game on game four. Um, he He's just not that mobile athletic guy to be running up and down the floor. And my, a big issue I have with Miami is, you know, like Wade, for example. Obviously, he's been offensively, he's been solid in most of this series. But, you know, Wade had the most shots of anybody on the Heat with 22 shots in 26 minutes for 25 points. Obviously, the shots were falling, but, you know, I, you know, Wade is a Hall of Famer and all of that, but he is not supposed to be the vocal point of an offense at this point in his career. And for the Heat, he is. And, and I think me, that that's says a lot about the Heat roster and the pieces yeah, they have. Yeah, 100% where I was going with that. You know, that's an issue to me if – is if majority of your offense has to come from the 36-year-old off the bench, it means you're probably in a tough spot. Yeah, it's definitely been tough for them. And I don't know if there's a ton they can really do to kind of make any changes. Like I said, um, you know, Goran Dragic, you know, is either having a big game or Dwayne Wade to kind of lead you. It's kind of worrisome. So yeah, it and, could and be. 
And draft picks five. has been has been steady, but you know it. You know, he's 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 a scoring guard. I think the issue with with the Heat, and I've had this issue with with uh, Dragic for um, most of his careers, they don't have a point guard. You know, they, there's really not a guy on this team who gets other people involved, and you know does a great job of of facilitating. You know, it's it's kind of a a share the ball around type of atmosphere. You know, everybody moves the ball, but you know, I don't think that can necessarily work against a team like Philly. Like, you need somebody at times in the half court set who can really you know, orchestrate an offense. And I don't know if Miami has that. Yeah, I mean, Dragic has done it at times, but it's a lot in the fast break, getting things going and then finding somebody open. I think their half-court offense in general just isn't very good, and that has to do with just not having a ton of talented scorers. You know, a lot of their guys are versatile. They're good at a whole bunch of different things, but nobody's really an elite scorer, and I think that hurts them. But moving on Agreed. to the series that is over. And this is probably the biggest surprise in the NBA first round of the postseason. The Pelicans swept the Blazers 4-0. Anthony Davis dominated 33 points a game, 12 rebounds, 2.8 blocks, over 57% from the field. Drew Holiday said, remember me, put some respect to my name, 27 points per game on 56% from the field and four rebounds and played some extremely good defense on Dame Lillard. Yeah, um, so I'm all for one on predictions. Me too. Uh, this, this series did not go seven. Uh, the Blazers were <laughs> were wildly disappointing. Um, CJ McCollum obviously showed up for Game Four. Lillard is still a no show. Um, we're still looking for him, even though the series is over. Uh, that was a pitiful performance by a guy who I had in my top five for MVP voting. Um, obviously, they did a great job defensively on him. Drew Holiday. Deserves all the props in the world. Uh, the whole Pelicans being... team really just took him out of his game and made his life miserable. And it was a little bit on Terry Stotts, I think, not finding a way to make Dame's life a little bit easier. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think we also finally realized how inequipped the Blazers are for the playoffs. Um, obviously, McCollum and Lillard are there, but you know the third highest salary on the team is Evan Turner. And yeah, exactly. uh, Evan Turner is not the third best player on that team by any means. Uh, Nurchik was completely outclassed by Anthony Davis. Um, Mo Harkless obviously was banged up. It, it's uh, the Blazers to me. I think I've I tweeted this a couple days ago. I think they're in for a a major either retool or a fire sale this off season because this team just the the Pelicans just dismantled them. Playoff Rondo, Holiday, Mirchik. I mean, the Pelicans are playing the best basketball they've played all year right now. And the crazy thing is they still have DeMarcus Cousins. Yeah, the Pelicans are one of those teams playing with like that irrational confidence right now. So they're a scary team in the rest of the postseason. Like you said, the Blazers just didn't show up. On Players Watch with Evan yesterday and Ryan, we talked a little bit about their offseason possibilities, so check that out. But really not much other to say about the Blazers and they didn't show up. And the Pelicans going into the next round, do you feel a lot more confident against them in a matchup with Golden State? I'm not. I mean, I still think the Warriors win it, of course. Um, but I, I'm not, I'm not against saying that the Pelicans win one, maybe two games. Uh, AD at least a game one. by himself, right? And he's shown that you know through eight games in the playoffs, he's been better than any other you know Hall of Famer we've seen. Uh, he's been phenomenal, and I think when Drew Holiday is playing with this kind of confidence, and the the defense is what really sticks out for me on Holiday is just how. You know a, how quick his hands are, how quick his feet are. You know how strong he is. Yeah, I, I never really realized that about Holiday, and obviously in this series, he really brought it all to light. And then um, Rondo, uh, I think playoff Rondo is is a real thing. Is, yeah, it's and it's not even playoff Rondo; it's Rondo. I, I think just defensively, he just turns it up enough because offensively, the playmaking, all that we've seen that all year. You know, that's not anything new. It's just the the defense. Um, and, you know, Mirachik had that huge game two or game three explosion. Uh, the Pelicans, I'm sure Preston Ellis is, you know, jumping up and down. I, I've been to New Orleans last year. I think the French Quarter is having a blast. That's a party area. Um, they deserve it. The Pelicans, you know, after a long drought of not winning the playoffs, have finally seen some success finally. Yeah, I think this is, you know, tied for the longest run in franchise history. Last time it was Chris Paul when they were the Hornets. And in terms of New Orleans in general, they really haven't had much sense since the Saints won a Super Bowl. So We don't talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, Corey. 
But, um, <laughs> you know, that's that wraps it up, though, for today. We'll be back this week for more playoff talk. Let us know what you think on Twitter at OTG Basketball. Also, you can, you know, listen to the pod at any time on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, and OTG Basketball on Google Play.